used to live in Johannesburg for 10 years, and then we started, we came back to America, and we were in Florida for 10 years, then God moved us to Atlanta, we've been in Atlanta since 2000, and we belong to a local church there, that's, actually it's an all black church, basically African American, and we're one of the few white faces there, but uh, it's just amazing how God put us in the mix, and uh, and we've been, uh, that's our local church, it's called the Father's House, and we're going to be traveling from this point uh, back to Germany, Siggy, uh, of course, some of you who don't know her, but most of you do, but she grew up in East Berlin, uh, they lived under Russian occupation, their family escaped, and uh, then it was then that she was saved through her brother, who we really work closely with now. He has some projects that he does in Africa, and, and God <coughs> blessed him. And he was a successful businessman. He sold his business, and God is using him to, to help people in different ways. And uh, so we, uh, we're very close to him now, and, and we're able to really have fellowship in a way we never had earlier in his life. And so after Germany for three weeks, we go to Denmark for one week, and then we go back to America and we'll be traveling different areas, uh, New York, and Minnesota, and Montana, different places. <laughs> and um, and then we'll, in October, go back to South Africa for another month. I have meetings there, and we'll be in his church in Durban. Uh, and so that's kind of the way we operate. We stay, we come home for a couple of weeks, and we stay home over Christmas and a few other times. And uh, we do have a home there that we're, we're mortgaging now. Uh, we're almost got it paid off, but uh, God's been good to us. We've been able to have our own home. We have two children. We have a daughter, Tammy, uh, and our, we homeschooled our kids in South Africa. Like uh, our son was six months old, and Tammy was two years old when we came to South Africa. So we homeschooled them um, for a number of years before they. Um, uh, at, when we left South Africa in 1990. Yeah, wasn't it 1999? Yes. Yeah. So our kids so finished their school, and, and uh, they love South Africa. They love, they still call it people auntie and uncle from the time they were there. <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, it's, South Africa is a part of our heart. It's, we, you know, in 1980, God spoke to us and said, uh, actually spoke first to Siggy and said, I'm going to send you to South Africa. And he said, where is South Africa? <laughs> 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 and... Uh, and it was funny because we prayed, well, God, he gave us a confirmation. Somebody brought up to us a coin, yeah. a Kruger Rand. We didn't know what a Kruger Rand was. We never heard of it before. But you know, I prayed and I said, Lord, we need to know if it's you. And the guy came up to me in the next in the meeting. He said, this is what the Lord told me to give you because you need the confirmation. Wow. wow. <laughs> yes. And uh, we, we literally, hard, we didn't know a soul in South Africa. I think... The only person we met, Siggy preached in Israel in the, uh, it was that Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles. And she was the German counter to the Israelites, uh, the reconciliation. Mm. And there we met a couple from Bloemfontein. And uh, so the first city that we ever went to was Bloemfontein. Wow. Uh, <laughs> into the Afrikaans uh, churches. That's where we started. Amazing. It, amazing. I mean, uh, and so we, uh, that's how we started out. And and uh, then it just grew, and after a few years of being there and just kept doing it, just we expected to be there six weeks, and then we stayed ten years. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then it was amazing because after a few years, uh, then uh, things begin we begin to have relationships more and credibility, and uh, and then at one stage, one pastor came up to us and said. You know, you, he gave a, a really encouraging word. He said, you're going to see the fruit of your labors in this land. And so what's happened is, is really things turned around. Uh, where we used to almost financially were just burdens that we could hardly do anything. That God began to give us a greater flow and that we had ability to live and, and do things that uh, we, we didn't before. So God does honor faithfulness and he does honor if you will stick to a certain thing, you know, if you just stick to certain, I think yeah. the problem today is people abort the purposes of God. They abort what God has because as soon as there's resistance, as soon as there's things don't work out, as soon as the, a situation is seems adverse, people get all bent out of shape. And 
And I think it is the wisdom of God and uh, is that we, we can begin to understand that God uses everything and anything to mm. form and fashion us. And maybe that's why it says in James, you know, if you need wisdom, ask for it, you know. Or, you know, we get trials come in your life. Uh, sometimes we, we don't know how to grasp that. We don't know how to interpret that. But the wisdom of God is that we see God's hand in everything and all things. And no matter how adverse it seems, if we really do trust Him, He's going to He's going to make that thing and fashion things in our lives, using those situations to bring about His goodness in our life. And Amen. It's uh, it's called the discipline of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you have to be disciplined by the Holy Spirit, and we have to be sensitive to that and obey that voice. Okay, and this is the scripture Sidney's going to minister out of. It's in Ecclesiastes, <coughs> chapter 3, a very well known verse. Verses, of, for what, how many verses? You just from 2 to 8. I mean, I'm not getting through that, but just yeah. for the context. Okay, uh, to everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to plant, and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to throw away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silent, a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. Heavenly Father, I just <coughs> thank you so much that we can be here tonight. And Lord, I know that every one of them here is chosen and called by you to fulfill in this generation their destiny and their purpose. And Lord, help me Lord, just to bring across how precious time is and how many times are we wasting our times because of just of things interfering in our life. And Lord, I just ask you that you will just take this word and make it alive to us, mm -hmm. to make us realize in this day, Lord, that you have given us a span of life to make decisions so that you can shape and form and mold us for your purpose and destiny. So, Lord, just bless your word and let the anointing just break every yoke. And, Lord, I don't know where I'm going and how much I can say, but whatever it is, Lord, I pray that your word will not be information, yes. but impregnation. Mm -hmm. Lord, this day we have so much information, but not with little impregnation. Mm -hmm. And what we need that seed to impregnate our life to birth forth destiny and purpose so that we can run the race and fulfill our destiny in, in our lifetime. So bless your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You know, somebody says when you read the Ecclesiastic, when you finish reading it, you're more depressed than when you started. <laughs> when you look at Solomon's life, you can see that actually I looked some of the commentaries up and they believe that Ecclesiastic, that Solomon had actually an awakening. Now, in Ecclesiastic, he does not speak out of desire. And he does not speak out of longing. Um, I mean, when, when you look at Solomon's life, he was born the son of Solomon in Bathsheba. And he, uh, when David comforted Bathsheba, then was, when was Solomon born? And his name means forgiveness and uh, forgiveness and so you can see as Solomon and Bathsheba birthed Solomon the prophet came and he declared him this is Jedediah that means the darling of the Lord and the Solomon was the one who fulfilled his father's dreams and he walked um, I mean Solomon walked in so much wisdom and knowledge that we can't even comprehend it that the queen of Sheba came to see him and she came out of the palace and she said, the half has not been even told unto me. But we know the story how Solomon's heart has been turned away. And here, in, I believe in Ecclesiastic, he realized how all the pleasures and all these things had been in vain. And he recognized something. I think you have to come to a certain age to recognize 
what God does. You know, some things is like you can never have old, you can never make old friends. Old friends you cannot make, ever old friends. Old friends are there where you have to make new friends so they can become old eventually because it is only to a process of time and maturity that you can grow into the wisdom and knowledge of what God has. Now, when you look at Ecclesiastic, now I'm going to just pick out a few things because you can preach almost a sermon on every one of them. But when you pick out, you can see when the Lord speaks of time, time has nothing to do with eternity. Time is a season, a lifespan God has given us. And you know, there's two things you have no choice over. The two, two things is when you're born and when you die. You have no choice when you're born, and of course, unless you commit suicide, you have no choice when you die. Because here, you have one lifespan. God gives you a time and a season. And in this time and in that season, you have to make choices in your life to fulfill and to complete your destiny of what God wants to do in your life and through your life. Now, when you look at this, you know, when I look at the children of Israel, and this is so amazing. Uh, as they come into the promised land, the first thing which happened, that some, you know, some of us, we always want revival, and we think of revival of miracles and signs. But if you come into your possession, God, in the true move of God, when you come into maturity and into the rest of the Lord, this has nothing to do with miracles because as the children of Israel moved into the promised land, the miracles stopped. And they know miracles are like manna, water of the rock, the shoes didn't grow old. Uh, I mean, they live from one miracle to the next. Now, when they come into the promised land, they had to learn time and they had to learn season. With other words, they've been nomads. They're living in the desert and here suddenly to come and to fulfill the promise is not just they lay there and had a dream and the cows bring milk and the bees bring honey and they're going to have all the fulfillment God has done in their life. They had to learn the seasons of their life. They had to learn when to sow and when to harvest and, and when, what seasons are coming in your life. And you know, I realized when I travel around, I'm preaching a long time and I realized that some people are spiritually spoken. Now, you naturally think of, with what, what would you think of a person who don't like winter and he prays all winter long, God, make it summer. I mean, it's foolish, isn't it? Doesn't matter how you pray, maybe God will not give you a windstorm or snowstorm and he maybe help you with the eyes, but he's not going to change your, uh, the seasons to your prayer. I mean, it's ridiculous. And you don't go to change a pear tree to an apple tree. You know if you put an apple seed in the ground, you're going to get an apple out of that tree. Now, spiritual spoken, that's how people do. We waste a lot of spiritual effort because we don't know seasons and we don't know what God's loss is and God's uh, economy is and God's uh, power is. And so we are to continuously, uh, don't, and we want to live in miracle power, but we don't understand the timing of our life. Now, there is a time and a season, and we know the seasons in our life, and you, you know that you develop, and you can see in our own life, I'm mean, married 40 years, I'm preaching 50 years, I have gone to seasons in my life where I had a learned thing, how to sow and how to reap. But in, besides the seasons, there's a Cairo time. Now, a Cairo time speaks of an appointed time. That is, you don't choose that time. That is when the Holy Spirit comes up on your life and suddenly he comes and he awakens you. And you cannot say, well, wait a minute, I don't feel ready. My husband maybe doesn't agree and I don't feel like it. And I'm not going to repent now. And I'm not going to open up now because it's too many consequences. Now, when these Cairo times come in your and my life, what that means, if I don't yield to it, 
that you cannot regain it, that you actually wasted the time and you have not allowed God to impregnate us and to move into that what the Lord has in our life. So what I believe now when, when the spirit is moving and you can see right now there is a, a revival in uh, Virginia, uh, in West Virginia and an awakening and it's a Cairo time. I mean, that's a Cairo time for God to breathe. If you don't get a hold of it in that moment, you can't wait 10 years from now to have the same experience. It's a Cairo, a divine time. In all of our life, all of us, the impregnations of the Spirit, and the filling of the Spirit, the power of the Spirit, it's absolutely Cairo time where I have to make choices in these times, in these times where God wants to know. Now when Solomon speaks about an ecclesiastic, when you see there's a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill, and the time to heal, you can see it's time is a pendulum swing. I mean, now you have a digital clock, but it, it's a pendulum swing. Every moment a second is gone. You cannot relive it. You cannot regain it. You know that these times are gone. You maybe have great memories, but you cannot hold on to time because that is a time and the season in our life. Now, I, I realize when the pendulum swing comes, you can realize that you don't get power just become because you're positive. You see, some of us, we think that we have power because we're positive. It's impossible. Because here, in the pendulum swing of time, you can see what the Lord says. All things work together for good. So the positive can turn negative, and the negative can turn positive. Depends what choices you make in your life and how you see the time in your life and what God does in your life. That is the pendulum swing in your life. And you see, some people, they don't go with the pendulum swing. We don't understand the season and we waste what God does. Now here he says, in, in, uh, there's a time to plant and there is a time to uproot. Now, when you think of it, Jesus, God did not come and he said, well, I'm going to create man on the first day and I'm going to teach him how to be a farmer. I'm going to teach him how to be a scientist. I'm going to teach him how to create and how to do these things in your life. No. What did he do? He planted. He rooted things. He planted things. He grew things. And he put man into the things he planted in an environment because when, and this is what the kingdom of God is all about, because God brings a seed. He plants something within our life to create an environment for God's presence to be able to be manifested. Now the second time too, he planted. Why? First, the, uh, the, the children of Israel knew God's glory from above. Now, when did God's glory from, <coughs> our come from above amongst the children? It's because they had to build. They had to create an environment for God's presence to come from amongst to above. And God put the spirit of, of wisdom upon the children of Israel to know how to do gold, gold silver. And the women knew how to knit, how to sew, how to create. So God's presence could come from above amongst the people and now he wants to come within us so for in us when he comes he's not above us amongst us he's within us and when you see many of us we don't find them within us because we have to create an environment so God's glory can be manifested not only what you read but what you become in Christ Jesus and who he is. Now, when there is a time to plant and there is a time to uproot. Now, what did the prophets have to up do first? And what is the prophetic ministry? The prophetic ministry, it's not just to give personal prophecy. The prophetic ministry too is up to uproot. What did he say to Jeremiah? You pull out. You uproot. So I can do what? So and plant. And bring forth something new. Now when you look at Gideon. Now the name of Gideon means um, big fighter. Now Gideon was not a big fighter. He was from the tribe of Manasseh. And he was dressing wheat in a, in a cave. Now you can't in a wine press. 
Now you must, must, when the Midianites come, you have to understand. Here the children of Israel up in the mountain. But when they came, they're sowing and they're planting. But the Midianites came and they destroyed the harvest. So what they do, Gideon goes into the cave. And in a cave, he dresses wheat in the vine, uh, wheat in the vine press. Now, the wheat, you cannot thresh wheat in the vine press because the vine press is there to get the vine. You stamp it out. There is no, uh, it's, it's secure. But the wheat has to be in the threshing floor where the wind blows and where the shaft is separated from the wheat. If you don't have wind in those days threshing the wheat, you would have a mixture where you are not pure wheat, where the shaft is mixed into the meat and for the bread becomes not quite digestible as it's supposed to. So as Gideon is in the mountain, he dresses wheat in the wine press and the angel comes and Gideon says this, he said, he said, I'm going to use you. You're going to be a great man. I'm going to use you in power. And Gideon says, and now he speaks out of his experience. He says, but Lord, we're the least in my father's house. Household, we have never seen miracles for a long time. We have not seen any manifestation of God's glory and God's power. He said, yes, you're going to be it. Now you have to realize, when you look at in the Bible, the men of Manasseh. Now the men, man, the name Manasseh means he makes me forget. Now you remember, he was a son of Joseph. Now Manasseh was born in the time of Joseph. Well, Joseph was absolutely needed comfort because he lived in Egypt. He was betrayed by his brother. He was homesick for his dad. He was separate from his family. He went over to slavery. And finally he got free and God got him out. And he took that little baby boy and he took him in his arm. And he said, this is Manasseh. He makes me forget. He makes me forget my sorrow. And he makes me forget my suffering. And guess what? Many of us are like that. Now remember, when Jacob was old and he was blind, and Joseph brought his two sons, Ephraim means double fruitful, and he comes and he crisscrosses his hands. And I said, Lord, why did you do that? And I realized, because Ephraim means double fruitful. You know why? Because Manasseh made Joseph forget, but Ephraim gave him a future. And you see, many of us, when we come to Christ, all Christ does, he make us forget, but he doesn't give us new goals. We don't have new goals. We don't have a new future. We just want to forget what we were and who we were, but we don't see what God wants to do in our life. Now, the modern Jewish explanation for Manasseh means this, to regain your inheritance under difficult circumstances, in the absence of friend and loved ones. And here's Manasseh, Gideon. Here he stands. Now how can God use a guy like that to take 300 people and fight about a multitude of Midianites? What did he do before God could plant? He had to uproot. The first thing he did, he had to uproot the idol of his dad. He came against the idol of his dad. He broke down the idol of his dad so that God could plant something within him. And you know, he comes, he did not get his new mindset praying. He got it there as he stood on top of the mountain and he had the dream of the Midianites, how that wheat loaf was rolling down and it was crushing the Midianites. And you know, it's an all of our life as a pendulum swing. There's a time to uproot when God comes and we don't uproot. You know, what that means, God cannot sow in, in our hearts new things of our life because we don't uproot. You can never, ever have that planted within you if you don't uproot what God wants to do in you and through you. And he gives me times to do it. You can't just choose it. There are times where you have to rise up and kick off every idol. I mean, some of us, we make even an idol of Jesus, which uh, 
which comes when I say an idol of Jesus, that is just your mindset, where you have a strong imagination what Jesus is, but it's not spirit and truth. So you can have a strong imagination of Jesus, and if Jesus doesn't fulfill your ex expectation and mind, we get disappointed and hurt and wounded, and we wonder what it is, why he didn't bless me, because he's, we did not worship him in spirit and truth. We worship him in imagination. And what God does, he brings times in my life where I have to rip out things so he could build and plan things in my life. And then here comes, he says, that is a time to kill and there's a time to, to heal. Now kill, what does it mean to deprive of life? It's a sacrifice. And you know what it says in Romans 8, 4, 4, 13. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what happened? The cross, it's not a burden. When you carry the cross, it's not a heavy burden. The cross is actually an instrument to kill someone. The cross killed Christ. It was not just something that he carried a burden. He killed it. Now, I remember I was preaching this here many years ago. Remember when Peter, all of us, when we grow up, we, we can have to a certain level, and I think many people come to a certain level, but we don't uh, make our spiritual exams to move on. We stay on that same level. And I would say that every church today is on kindergarten level. We, I mean, we, we want milk. We don't want food. We want to suck. We want to suck the honey and suck the milk. And to do God's will, you cannot suck. You have to chew. You have to digest. You have to have teeth to eat. And uh, God's people don't want to eat. God's will is not something I do. It's something I digest and something I become and something God can do through me in my life. It's not just something that he pleases me all the time, that I rise up. And I, you know, I, I realize in my life, I, I mean the different phases I went to. I can tell you many, many testimonies in David and I of our personal experience. But when I think of Peter, he comes to the upper room now. Sometimes the natural and the spiritual are very close together. You know, some of us, we don't, that, well, that's why God always uses parables, because we don't understand mysteries. So he, he says to the disciples, for you, it's easy to understand mystery, because I have given you the knowledge. But those that understand it, I have to talk in parable. I use natural things. Now, what's a parable? Where well, you use one thing to compare it to another. And it's like, you know what a parable is? It's like a nut. You have to crack it open to get the truth. And if you don't crack it open, God can talk to you. You don't get the truth. And the lazy man will never get the truth. Because a parable, when God used my natural thing to give me a spiritual truth, he has, I have to crack it open. And I start, once when I went to South Africa, I watched the gorillas. And, you know, they love nuts. And I laughed because I was just peeking on the parables because these big, mature gorillas, they knew how to crack the nuts. They took the stone and they break it and they get these nuts out. And when they see the young gorillas, they hurt it themselves. They take the stone, they get their <laughs> paws stuck and they cry. And eventually what they do, they steal the nuts from the old one because they don't know how to crack it. And they know that's with us like that. We take from each other because we don't know how to crack the mysteries of God open in our own lives. So we take from each other, but we don't know the truth he, uh, the Holy Spirit says that he's going to teach me all truth and leads me in all truth. So I have to learn these things. So here is uh, Peter. He comes up to the upper room and he, the smell is stimulating. He's hungry. He waits to eat. And God uses hunger to show him the truth. There comes a sheet down and the Lord says all kinds of stuff in the sheet, in that sheet. And he says, rise up, Peter, kill and eat. He says, no, Lord, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to kill it. I'm not going to kill it. I, I'm a Jew. I'm not going to eat. He says three times, rise up, kill, and eat. Now, what the Lord says actually to Peter, and I always say that, Peter, if you don't kill your creep, your creep going to kill you. Now, what was Peter's creep? He didn't talk naturally. He didn't talk about port, and he didn't talk about lost stuff. 
He talked about prejudice. Because Peter would not accept Cornelius. Cornelius was accepted by God. But the Jew in those days, so what God had to, he comes against culture. So what did Peter have to do? He had to actually kill. So that he was the head of revelation. That God is respecter, no respecter of all people. He was, he was going to pull out the spirit, not only at, upon the Jews. He's going to speak pour out the spirit upon all Gentiles. And you see, this is all of us. And sometimes our culture is so strong that it kills the truth. And so there's a time that you can't choose it, but there's a season in your life where God comes and you have to kill that which kills you. It's like me. When, when the Lord called us to bring Bibles into Russia, uh, I was living 15 years under Russian occupation. We hated the Russian. I could smell a Russian. We lived with the Russian. We had to learn Russian. We, and the Lord speaking to me to go to Russia. Now, I tell you something. What the Lord had to do, I had to, the, the, the timing, man, the timing. The, I did not kill it. Right there, yes, Lord, here I am. I'm going to love a Russian. I had to come there. He had to bring times in my life where I could confront my feelings, where I would go to Russia, where I go to the borders, where the Russian would captivate us, where I had to kill the very things which would kill me. Now, I smuggled Bibles 10 years behind the Iron Curtain. Every month we would go and risk our life in those days. And i tell you something, what the Lord done, right? there's, a time, there's a time to kill, and there's a time to heal. And you know, I realized that before God can do any healing in your life, there's a season in your life. Remember when the children of Israel came, and they came finally, after three years of grumbling, they came into the desert, and there was Mara, the bitter water. And the Lord had to put in the wood to bring out of the bitterness sweetness. And that's the same with us. If we don't use the time to kill what kills us, there's in every of us, there's things which will kill what God does in your life, believe me. You don't need to struggle with what I struggle, but in all of us, there's things I've got to kill. He, what says, he doesn't say, I kill it. He says, Peter, rise up, kill and eat. That means what? Digest, this, digest the things which kill you. That's what it means. And in all of our life, and that affects marriages, affects family, affects he, all of our life to come into that, what the Lord has for us, so that we can walk truly in freedom and in liberty and the growth. I have to allow God in this time, where the word of God becomes a sword, where it kills me, and I can start, let the life of God start healing what was damaged and what was hurt and which, which um, was affected. And then, uh, I mean, I said, it's a, there's a time to tear, and there's a time to build up. I won't go into that, but I just want, want to mention this here. It's a time to weep, and there's a time to laugh. Now, you have to realize that Solomon comes to the place, you emotionally, it, today many of God's people are spiritual lepra. You know what a leprosy is, something you don't feel anymore. And today I can go to church sometimes and I realize that the Holy Spirit has to come like a hammer down because people are in such a state in their marriages, in their struggle of life, that they have become numb inside. And you know, you can't just choose to cry. It's impossible because some of us, we are absent. Now, I say to the Lord, when you look at Jesus standing on the grave of Lazarus, why did he cry? I mean, he knew he's going to do a miracle. You know that he's going to take him out of the grave. And he's, why would he cry? He did a great miracle. Why did he laugh there and say, hallelujah, he's going to come out? He stood on the grave crying. Now, why was he crying? Because something touched him, it touched him. The women touched him. It's the country, maybe the unbelief touched him. There's a something what Jesus expressed in the emotional state. He wept over Jerusalem. And you see, today what happens is, 
when we don't allow it. The Lord says, blessed are you who would weep now, for you shall laugh. Now, what does tears show when you're emotional? When God can come and he touches you, it shows that you're not just complacent. You know how many spiritual people are complacent? We have spiritual cancer, but we are complacent because the statistic and all these things, I mean, we are intercessors and we are complacent because we don't know how to cry and we don't know how to be moved in our depths of our emotion. And the Lord says that. Now, if I don't know how to cry, I don't know how to laugh. Isaac makes laughter because it's a candle and swing. <laughs> and most of us, I, I, I mean, the women can naturally can cry easier than men. I, I know on one time I, I've been in, when you hurt, we can intercede so good. And I remember when I was a young woman then, and as people hurt me. I, I was not um, really famous woman preaching the way I, how I preached anyway. So I would cry, and I would cry because I was been so hurt. And one day the Lord speaks to me, and he said, Say, what's the matter with you? You think I'm a man that your tears move me? I'm not a man. I'm God. I see your heart. I see your life. Strengthen yourself. And don't, and you know, from then on, I think something happened, I cried. But I don't cry anymore of self-pity, that I feel sorry for myself. Because something happened, there's a time to cry. And there's a time to laugh. So when God comes in the movement in your life, I mean, it's like we went, for instance, to Botswana. And I said, we had a women's conference, a women's day. There was 500 women there, or 600. And I said, Lord, what do I speak to these women? I mean, many of them came from the farms, from out of the bush, and, and they could see their life. They were living hard lives. And the Lord says to me, I'm going to comfort them. And I preached on something. So as I preached, I didn't even make an altar call. About 400 women shut out of that seat, and they came, and they were howling and weeping and screaming. And I said, Lord, I thought I'm going to comfort them. And he said, yes, they've been distant to grief. And when you become distant to grief, you don't feel anything. And how can I reach them if they don't feel and here to the word, they opened them up. And for the first time, of many of them, they wept. Because when you suffer in a certain way in your life, you become distant to the very thing where God wants to move in your life. And instead to be pliable and soft, we become hard. So how do I stay soft? It's a time. Because as I yield my life unto him, there's a time to weep. And then there's a time to laugh. It's a pendulum swing where God will exp give you expression <laughs> how he has created us and what he is. So you know what he said to the church of Laodicea? That was his, pro that was his complaint that they're indifferent. They're lukewarm. And lukewarmness doesn't mean you're hot for the spirit. You don't feel nothing. You don't feel anything inside. And you see how many people love the Lord and their spiritual. They have no feeling inside. They don't feel nothing anymore. They don't know how to open up to feel these things God wants to use my heart to feel. Now then he said there's a time to mourn and there is a time to dance. Now <coughs> then, dance speaks of rhythm where you can move in rhythm of the rhythm of life. Now, mourning, you remember how David danced, uh, he, when did he dance before the Lord? And Michael looked out of the window and she despised him, was after he mourned about Uriah. Because Uriah touched the ark and they didn't know how to bring the presence of the Lord into Jerusalem. They put it in an ox cart. They did it the Philistines way. But you had to carry the weight of God's glory. And the Levites were not trained. And they put it on an ox cart. And they went and he touched it. And David mourned. He mourned. 
He put sackcloth on. You know what mourning means? You take off your identity. Mourning, if, if, if in those days people mourn, the king and the priest and the merchant all look alike. Because when you wore the sackcloth and the king took off his crown and they put on the sackcloth, you couldn't discern if it was the merchant, if it was a shepherd, or if it was it takes away your individuality and it brings a spirit of brokenness. And this is what he saw when you repent and mourn, I'm going to heal your land. Now I'm going to heal what, what I'm going to bring forth in your land. Now, you know, when David mourned, and after he mourned, and he saw, saw how Obed-Edom, the Levi who had the ark, was so blessed, he brought in the ark into Jerusalem, and he danced with all his might. Now, you know, I love this. There is a, a, a law in the Bible, and it's called the law of war. Now, today, many people don't understand the Old Testament because... Uh, we we want we are humanistic and we think God is fair, but God is not fair. He's righteous. That's a whole different thing. So if you're more than Christian and you love God in a human way and you're humanistic, you never understand the Old Testament whatsoever. But God is the same yesterday and today forever. But anyways, there's a law in the Bible, and that is the law of the war. And they say when the soldier goes into the town. He has to kill everybody. That was because God didn't want to be mingled. But he said, if there is a virgin who did not know any man and who has not been defiled <coughs> to any sexual act or whatever, <coughs> that he can take this girl and make her his wife. But he said, when you take this girl and you like her, the Lord says in that law, then you give her one month of mourning. Now, in that one month of mourning, she had to uh, change her clothes, she had to cut her nails, she had to cut her hair, and she had to mourn her father and her mother for one month. Now, in that one month, there had to be transition made. Imagine, imagine here you are, and everybody got killed. And this guy says, now, in a natural, you're going to be my wife, and you're going to be a part of my life. Now imagine that, if you're bitter and you don't release all that bitterness in that one month, that you can never become this guy's wife. Now this woman, for after one month, and the guy said, she is, she's not only beautiful outside, she's beautiful inside. She's going to be my wife. Now what happens when a wedding comes? Out of that morning comes a dance a movement of joy and expression. Now when you, when you look at in our life, what does the Lord do? He makes us, we have to go to mourning when we come to the Lord, to lose everything so we have gained. Now what are we? I, I have not chosen him, he has chosen me. Suddenly he came and he changed my life. Just like this guy. He came in my life suddenly and he changed my life. I didn't ask for it. He just did it. And I had to go to what? To a time of mourning. I had to release everything. So out of that mourning could be created a dance, a movement of joy so that I can no longer be sorrowful over the things I lost, but I can dance because of what I have gained in the Lord, because dancing is a sign of rejoice, of skipping, of jump, of jump, and you know that's of all of our life. It's a season and the time. And if you don't understand the pendulum swing in your life, you will see how we are never come to butterflies. We will be all cocoons. We always will desire to become, but never are. Because the whole process from a cocoon to a butterfly, from a caterpillar, it's timing. It's a timing. Nobody can force it. It's the perfect timing of the same in our life. It's a timing which God has in his hand. And the pendulum swing goes in your life. And in that time I'm born to the time I die. I have to allow that timing to bring seasons in my life which will produce fruit. 
and life and color and beauty and anointing and glory. Now, um, let me not go only in one more thing because you can see it could be very long. In Ecclesiastic 3 verse 5 it says, there's a time to throw stones and there's a time to gather stones. Now stones are not good or bad. It depends what you do with it. Stones, is remember that when the children of Israel came um, and they went into Jordan, but the, they had to do, they had to take stones out of the Jordan to build a memorial, to remember. And there are certain things in your life <coughs> which you have to build so that, because when you think of it, when in eternity there's no time. Imagine your time is gone. Now, what does that mean? If you're all before the Lord, doesn't matter how long we live, and my time is gone, there's no, uh, man, let's face it, Today, when you wake up tomorrow, this is the past. What you have experienced today is the past. So when I stand before the Lord, there is no difference what I experienced 40 years ago now. Because we are in eternity. So it's not the time which has passed, how I have used the time. What decisions I have made. What I used in my life span. Because 40 years ago will be the same important as what I do now. In eternity. Because there's no time. There's the time is gone. And here we are in eternity. And the things I have done have produced as I used the timing of my life to have a season and to make decisions and to mature so I can complete my destiny. If you don't use your time, you can never complete your destiny. Now, God can do in five minutes what he can do in 50 years. And some people, if you know how to yield in the right timing, you understand what I mean. So what I have to do is, what do I have to do? I got the bill. So that the past will be the same important as my future. So that I can remember God's touch, remember God's glory, remember God's anointing in my life. Now, then there's another thing is uh, stones can be a weapon. Now you see what happened to David. What did he take? How did he fight Goliath? He took a stone out of the brook and he killed Goliath as he took that stone and he brought that and he shot him with a slingshot, and he killed him. So what does the Lord say in, in 1 Peter? He said, you are, Jesus is a living stone cut out of the rock, and you also are living stones. Now, when the seed grows and the seed is thrown, what happens if you don't deal with the stones in your heart? <coughs> You don't produce no <coughs> fruit. So the stones are the hard places in your life. So what happens, these things God crystallized can become a weapon in his hand to kill the enemy, can become a memory, or it becomes a resistance. So the seed of the word cannot produce 30, 60, and 100 full life in your life. Then he says there's a time to embrace and there's a time to shun embracing. Now the, the, the Lord speaks about embrace means to hold in one's arm and to have a close association and a close affection. And remember what the Lord said to Elisha, to the Shunammite woman. He said, you're going to embrace a child. I'm going, that means you, I'm going to fulfill the desires of your heart. I'm going to bring something very close to you. But then there's a time for you shun embrace. Who Joseph had to run away from Potiphar's wife, who wanted to take him and snare him in. And there's a time that the pendulum swing. There's a time where you need to hang on, and me too, to the things. What God wants and put it close to my heart and hold fast to it. But there's a time where I have to run from it, where I don't fight it, where I flee from it, so that I can do what? Walk in the liberty and in the freedom. Now, when you see this, and you can just, I mean, you can just keep on preaching on it, but you can see in all of our life, 
the pendulum swing will come. And if we don't use it and to make the right decision in that lifespan I have, I never will become what I meant to be. I'm not talking about salvation. I'm, making, I'm talking about fulfilling our life, completing our life, doing what I'm born to do. You know, it doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. It doesn't mean I don't hurt. And it doesn't mean we don't fail. That's why Jesus died. That's why he gave us grace, because we can't do it on our own. We cannot. But I just thank the Lord, because listen, all of us, from the, every second, you cannot relive. Every minute I fail, I cannot regain, because it's gone. But I thank the Lord that he can just use it any second, and breathe upon us and awaken us to yield so that we not only look for pleasures in the lifestyle. I would think that 70% of God's people are looking for a lifestyle, but not for life. Mm. We can have a lifestyle of great pleasant and do not, not know life. Life is not a lifestyle. I've seen people live a greater life than people who created a lifestyle because life is a source coming out of my innermost being like a river of living water flowing as I made decisions to allow God to use times in my life to break me, to build me, to mold me and shape me, to help me to kill these things which kill me so that I might live and that we might bring forth through Christ this, the hope of our life. Would you just bow? Let's just pray and see what we see what God has for us. Yes, Father, we thank you, God, that, the, that we can look back and we can see seasons in our life, and we all c also can look at the present and see, Lord, even uh, stirring in our <coughs> hearts to bring us into something new, or to release something, or to embrace something, or to let some things die and rise up to embrace other things. Lord, uh, time to kill and time to heal. Lord, thank you that, Lord, that the Holy Spirit is there to lead us and guide us and help us to break loose of the things that would hold us back and help us to make progress and to grow and to develop in a way that is pleasing to you. So tonight we just declare to you, Lord, that you are able to take us and mold us and fashion us and make us into vessels that will bring pleasing to you, and that will bring glory to you. Thank you for his church. Yes. Lord, thank you for Charlene and Denver. Thank yes. you that they took upon themselves to step in this place of leadership and, Lord, to step in this place of responsibility that weighs heavy on their shoulders at times, I'm sure, Lord, because, Lord, of the concerns. And... The Lord would say unto his son and his daughter, yea, my daughter Charlene and my son Denver, this is a time when I'm going to show you my greatness. I'm going to show you that I'm bigger than the problems of men, that I'm going to do a work of grace in your life, and truly there shall come grace and there shall come wisdom, and, and don't fear the unknown and don't fear those things that, that you have questioned in your heart and, and are seeking because I'm going to lead you and I'm going to teach you, and I'm going to equip thee. And sometimes it seems so big and so heavy, but the Lord says that I'm going to use you as two <coughs> that shall flow together. I'm going to put a, 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 a grace upon your life, that you shall yes. have a flow in your life. And yes, that I'm yes. going to use you together in the yes. different functions and different uh, uh, gifting that you have. And I'm going to bring forth my glory through your life. I've called you out. And I've given you my favor. You're going to see my favor. You're going to see that I'm going to break open the realms, break open the limitations, and I'm going to give you grace to live and move ahead in the things that is in your heart. And know that there are things that I'm putting in your heart, and sometimes it seems so big, but the Lord says those things that I put in your heart, know that I will bring it to pass, and I will enlarge thee, and I will give thee capacities. And through my Holy Spirit, yes, I will yes. teach you and lead you, and I will help you to be that vessels that will elevate my name and that will build my church 
in the way that is pleasing to me. So fear not, because I'm breaking down walls and I'm going to enlarge. And as I enlarge, I'm going to give you the ability to build in a good way, in a solid way, saith the Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for my sister's life. Lord, when I look at her, I can see her hunger she has for you. And the Lord says, surely, my daughter, you have gone on a journey. And many times you have looked for something, and it seems like that you have gone to a desert. And you have said, oh, Lord, there must be more than what I'm eating. There must be more than what I'm having. And yea, that you have not known that I have put that longing within your heart. Because yea, that I have said, oh, Lord, it seems like so empty when others been excited. And when others said, oh, that is it you knew within your heart that there must be more and I have put a new weight of my glory upon your life says the Lord and yes you have even come to this nation I'm going to use you as a key to unlock hearts and to unlock lives because surely out of that bitterness of life I'm going to bring forth a new sweetness and you're going to see that I'm going to implant you and that you're going to be a part of that tree that I'm going to give you a field where you're going to be a and who you're going to know that you can put your roots deep because I have a plan and a purpose and you're going to see my hand and you're going to see the miraculous power be manifested in your life and through your life because you have not gone this far to turn away or to turn back and you have come this far my daughter to see my glory and behold my glory because surely this is a new season in your life, Shukaramasaya. Thank you, Lord. Thank Lord, we you, thank Lord. you for this couple, Lord Jesus. Darren and Kelly, Lord, we thank you for their lives. Yes. We thank you, Lord, that you have put within them, Lord, things, uh, gifting, and Lord, yes. uh, even the heart to build, and even a heart to to in, encourage and, and, and be excerpt exhortation, O oh Lord. And the Lord says, my daughter and my son, yes, yes. even as you build your family, I'm going to use you to build my church. I'm going to use you to yeah. give out wisdom, counsel, and encouragement. And there will be those that will come along and you'll wonder where they're going and you'll be in a voice of encouragement yes. and direction and giving you wisdom. And surely I've given you favor even in the marketplace. The Lord says that I will be your provision. I will make a way for you and I will establish thee. But I will use you as, as a couple of encouragement, of hope, a couple of destiny. Mm -hmm. And surely even thy thy relationship will speak life to many because of yeah. who you are and what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And surely be a good courage in this day. Know that even as you've gone through pressures of change and, and challenges, know that I'm going to even yeah. put, give you favor, that you will know that my hand is upon you and you will speak life to many people, even within and without the church, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes, Lord. My daughter, you are born for such a time as this. You have not chosen who you born and you have not chosen what I have done in your life and through your life, says the Lord. But in these days, you have known even as you've been a little girl that there was something imparted on you. You could not even understand or you could not even fathom because many times you looked within your heart and you have wondered how it even got there. But in these days, my daughter, you're going to birth that dimension of my glory. You're going to come forth in a new freedom and a new liberty because my hand is upon you and I'm going to fashion the inform you and you're going to see that as man looks for doors as you look to me I'm going to be your door and I'm going to be your opportunity and you're going to see my hand move on your life because that I'm going to make the impossible things possible and you shall surely become a woman who will declare the exploits of the Lord says the Lord because you're going to see the book of Acts shall be an action and you shall not be intimidated as you will rise up and walk and be even like a Deborah in the land who will live under the palm tree and know that it's a time there to declare that there is victory as others think there is defeat says the Lord yes Lord thank Shabbat. you Lord a time of settling I see Lord just to yes. build that foundation and to dig her roots deep Lord I thank you that you're going to settle her and keep her in your goodwill Lord, I thank you for Johan, Lord. I thank you yeah. for his life, Lord, and for his wife, Lord. We thank you that you have chosen to plant him, mm -hmm. Lord, to plant him in and to, to graft him in. And Lord, in this day, the Lord says unto thee, my son, 
Truly, I brought you to this place, and I've, I've ordered your footsteps. And sometimes you wondered where you'd end up. But the Lord says that I'm building in you that stability, that you can trust me in this day. There are many changes around you, and you've seen changes in even the lives of friends. But the Lord says, I will keep you, and I will establish you. My son, you need not to be anxious about the things, and how this will happen, and how that will happen. But I'll give you even that heart to love me and to have faith, that you will be strong in the midst of the storms that even when the storms blow and the winds blow and even when it seems like the flooding comes to a high level that I will give you the, the grace and the peace of God. I'll give you the calm in the midst of the storm and you shall know that I shall keep you and establish you and I will use you even to build also saith the Lord and you will be a friend indeed. You will build you will build and be a, a strength to many because of your faith and your strength saith the Lord and I will use you to bring and draw all many to the life of of and to the kingdom, saith the Lord, because of your stand and who you are and the fragrance that flows out of your life yes. that no man can deny. And even you and your wife, they be of good courage and know that I will keep you and establish you as you will walk together, as you choose to love me and serve me. Surely you shall see the fruits of that labor, saith the Lord. Yes, yes, yes. Lord, we thank you for Joel. Lord, we thank you for his life. What a precious young man, Lord. Yes. We see his cry in his heart. And the Lord says, surely, my son, in this day, as I have brought you through things, and surely he who has known my heart, and you have known the challenges, and you've known the shaking inside sometimes when you felt the frailties of your own flesh. And the Lord says that, my son, I'm building in you not a confidence in your own abilities, but a confidence in me. Because I'm going to build a strength in you. And fear not the vulnerability nor the weakness that, and, the, and the frailties that are anything, saith the Lord. Fear not the things that you feel and know from the things around you because I'm going to build a solid thing with you, you, a stability. I'm going to build my temple and know that this, even the stripping and things that you have experienced and things that you have felt, know that I'm going to build out of that something that will last. It's eternity, saith the Lord, for I'm surely stripping the outer man that the inner man might grow strong, saith the Lord. Yea, it is even my love and it is even my discipline. It is even my hand upon your life. Don't despise it, but know that I, the Lord, am doing a deeper work in you, for you shall be a man that shall stand, and you shall be a man that shall you know, bring forth my glory, and your voice shall be heard, and I will work out even things within you that you thought never could be worked out, because it will be by my spirit, and not according to your own strength and your own abilities, but surely I will show you my favor, and as you will lean toward me, as you will join and be in unity with me, that I will strengthen thee, and you shall be a man that shall stand even in the midst of the storms, and you shall be a man that shall declare my word and shall be a witness and testimony for me in this nation, saith the Lord. Yes, thank you, Lord. Lord Jesus, I thank you for my sister. When I look at her, I can see that you have done great things within her life. You have brought her to a place, O oh God, of absolute surrender. And the Lord says, surely, my daughter, there have been times where you could uh, you felt like that you've been a little chick and you felt like one with the wings being clipped and you didn't know how to fly. But in these days, my daughter, I'm going to make you one who will know how to fly. How to be still and know that I'm God because I'm going to make you one who will rise in the storm and who will know that no the limitations of yesterday can no longer hold what I will do in you and through you. And I want to say to you this day that I'm going to give you honey out of the rock, that there shall come a new satisfaction and a new fulfillment deep within your heart because I have seen the troubling and I have seen the fears and I have sometimes seen the doubt as you did not know what to do and how to do it. But in these days I declare to you, my daughter, that I'm going to make you crookedly straight and that you're going to see my hand and that you're going to stand and that I'm going to make your voice and that you're going to encourage many because of what I do not only in you and through you but for you saith the Lord thank you Lord thank you Lord hallelujah Lord Jesus 
Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you for our sister. And Lord, we're just thankful that, Lord, her willingness to serve you. Mm -hmm. And Lord, to go, even as we've heard her part of her story and her testimony. And we thank you, Father, for her life. That she's willing to do things perhaps others wouldn't even think about doing. Yeah. But Lord says unto his daughter that surely... My daughter, I have fashioned you even from a young age, that you'll be my handmaiden, that you'll be my servant, yes. to serve me in places wherever I lead you. And surely in this day, <coughs> I will keep you in my palm of my hand, and I will even reveal to the my secrets and my mysteries. And surely I will use you to be an a, a, a courager. You be like Deborah, that will be a woman of deliverance, that will deliver my people, and to help my people. And surely I will use you to encourage and to speak encouragement and to be a light in the darkness. And out of that light shall many be lifted up. In that darkness shall many be, know the hope and life of who I am because of your testimony, mm -hmm. because of who you are. You shall enlighten many hearts and the life of Jesus shall come to many because of the testimony of your life. For surely you shall... You shall leave a, a presence, and you shall leave an aroma wherever you go, saith the Lord. Yes. And out of that aroma shall come life springing forth. You will be a life giver. You'll be a, a stream of life and a hope and encouragement to wherever I send you, saith the Lord. And know that I will give you the strength to go and to come and to go in and go out with joy in the Lord. For surely my hand is upon thee, and as I lead you, and as thou art obedient, surely I will use you to encourage my people in places where they are very discouraged, saith the Lord, and where they have not known the hope. You shall be a voice of hope and encouragement to them, saith the Lord. Yeah, thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for Mother, too, for her life, and for her steadfastness, and truly say to Lord, my daughter, you have looked fulfilled, and you have wondered where you fit, and you have wondered what you can do, and yet in these days, my daughter, I have put your feet, feet into the aisle, and you're going to walk even with a new anointing in your life, because yeah, I shall renew your strength and renew your youth, and you're going to be a mother of Israel, encouraging many, says the Lord, you have faint hearted to get strength in them and to move into that what I have for them and know this day that I see your need that many times you have put your need to the side and you have said oh Lord and you have not thought that I would not fulfill your need but hey my daughter in these days I'm going to let you know that I'm going to that you are favored and that my favor shall be upon you and you're going to see that I'm going to just put your foot in oil how you're going to walk on the smooth of my anointing and you're going to see my hand just bring forth new life out of your heart and out of your life because <coughs> of the Lord. Let's pray for these two. Oh, Father, we thank you for this couple, Lord Jesus. Yes, and, oh, Lord, we thank you for the their willingness. Grandma. <laughs> they're Grandma. truly servants of the Lord, the Father. We thank you for their serving hearts, that they're willing to come and serve and, and, and be Lord and encouragement. The Lord says that truly in these days I've enlarged your heart and you shall truly, you have embraced your children. You have embraced those that I've brought you to. You have enlarged your house. Yeah. You have said, I'll be willing, Lord. I'll be willing. Give me strength. And the Lord says, surely I've strengthened thee this day. And I've given you a youthful spirit. And know that these are days when I will build in you such a, a strength in you and such a such a, a, a stability and, and, and strength you will be to many, saith the Lord, because you will speak encouragement and you will be an encouragement and a witness and a testimony of God's love and his strength and his longevity and who he is. Surely in these days know that I will make thee a blessing to many, saith the Lord. Yes. But even as you serve, know it as unto me. What you do, you do unto me. And uh, what you give to the smallest and the littlest shall be as unto me. As you give of that, so it shall come back to you. And you shall see the fruit of your labors, and you shall be satisfied. You shall be full, and you shall be full of joy in that which you do. And surely the Lord says, be of good courage, because I'm going to use you in this day like never before. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Amen. That was so powerful. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to say as well that David and Siggy have got a website.
And on the website, there's a few different, te well, a lot of teaching, really, of Siggy's. And the one she did last night is not up yet, because it's a new teaching. But if you ever wanted to just tap in and, and learn, because, I mean, there's so much that we can learn from David and Siggy. So please feel free to log on and, and get some of their resources, because it's, it's if you know, like I said to them in the car, if I could just sit under it and just learn, as you know. <laughs> It's wisdom, and I'm, I love that you always pray that it would be imparted or impregnated. And I, I want that. I want it to take root in our lives. Yes. So thank you. Thank you for yes. coming. Can we just pray for David and Siggy as well? Because yeah. they're going to um, Germany, and Siggy has to do a couple of days where she's preaching three messages in a row at a conference. And how many weeks? Six. Six in a weekend. Six in a weekend. Oh, so just <laughs> pray. Can you come stand on your feet? So if we yes. can just stretch out our yes. hands and. Just trust God in them. Father, I just thank you for David and Siggy, and I thank you, God, that even as as they share and pour, pour into our lives, God, we just stand in agreement as a church, and we say thank you. We honor them, and we thank you that they've honored the call of their life, your, your call on their life. And so, Father, we just pray for protection over their lives, and as they go into Germany, God, that they would see fruit, that they would see yes, your, your spirit like they've never seen it before, yes, Father Lord. God, that familiarity mm -hmm. would be broken, Lord God. And I thank you for just even a, a greater anointing, God, in you, that as Siggy speaks, even in her, in her ho home language or mother tongue, God, that she hasn't spoken for in years, God, there would be a flow, Lord God, like a river that flows and wells up within her and overflows, God, that she would not even have to think about what she's saying, but God, you would speak through her in Jesus' name. Father, I thank you that as, as they've sown into our lives and as there's just such a unity in their life, Father God, that you would command your blessing to go before them and to surround them and to come behind them. That God, even whatever the expectation is or, or, or um, yeah, whatever the expectation is in, from the people for this weekend and for this time in Germany, Father, you would far supersede yeah. and exceed thank those you. things god i thank you that there would be hope restored healing um, just poured out father god that mindsets would be renewed father god that there would be a, a, a flame that is ignited and that will be blazing yes, as they yes, speak and your spirit uh, just breathes on that in jesus yes. name and so father I, I thank you for their health i thank you for their strength i thank you for their joy i thank you father god for their lives and that you would just continue to use them father in jesus name Amen. 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 Thank you. <laughs> don't have a word. <laughs> the Lord said, Madam. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. All right. I'm going to. Uh, thank you.